Hi. Good morning. This is my Wednesday dance. Otherwise known as my Friday dance. Also known as my... Okay, who cares? It's the only dance I know. Hey, Gretchen is also here. Can we turn around and wave at Gretchen? Hey, Gretchen has a video camera, which that, that really should freak you out. Um, it shouldn't help you. Uh, so Gretchen is filming today so that crime students can watch the video and practice taking notes. Oh, fun! So, she's going to film me or, or the back of their heads, making his hand the back of their heads sometimes. Ho Just hopefully hands. not. Okay, yeah. Alright, so that's why Gretchen is here. Today, middle of week four. Don't look so thrilled. Video response today, I look forward to those. Quiz on Friday, just because it's a fr just to celebrate Friday. Just because Friday is such a great day, we should have a quiz to celebrate. So look ahead to that too. And good. Hey, let's talk about Rome. Speaking of the passage of time. Given the speed of the semester, it's always good to remind ourselves where we are. So, oh, we'll start this way. So the first dictator of Rome is Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar. All right. Or if you're from Lithuania, maybe you would say Julius Caesar. Um, so, Julius Caesar, the period of Rome before Julius Caesar, what's that type of government known as? What's that? The Republic, the Roman Republic. So a period in which Rome does not have a king, and that during that Republican period, Rome fights a series of wars called the Punic Wars against who's Rome's main enemy, or the Punic Wars were fought against, I should say. Carthage. Yes. All right. These descendants of the Phoenicians in North Africa. When Julius Caesar ascends to the throne, then the Republic is no more. And we talked briefly on Monday about his ascension. Again, he is a general who gains a loyal following among his troops and also gains a great deal of popularity back in Rome. And during a period of political crisis, Julius Caesar sees his chance to lead his army south from Gaul, this is the area today known as France, basically, leads his army south down the Italian boot, down the Italian peninsula, crosses the Rubicon, this river in northern Italy, and topples the power structure that existed and establishes himself as emperor. Now, technically, and your textbook talks about this too, but technically, Julius Caesar does not eliminate the Roman Republic in name. He still refers to the Roman Republic, just sees himself as its leader. So it's not as if Julius Caesar says, I am dictator, everybody give up your Republican vision of what Rome should be, and now do everything that I tell you. He still gives lip service, we might say. Can I use the phrase lip service? He's, he claims to be maintaining the Republic, but basically he is gathering power for himself, and again, he does not remain dictator very long. He is assassinated in 44 BC, just a few years after his ascension to power. He is assassinated by people who claim to be restoring the Roman Republic. However, that does not happen. After Julius Caesar's death, there is a civil war. There's a struggle for power. That may come as no surprise to you. Given the way a dictatorship is structured, often dictatorships are politically unstable. Because if power is concentrated in one man or one woman, when that person dies, then someone else, or the struggle for power is often intense. Power is not distributed among a wide variety of people. 
So there's a struggle for power between Octavian, Julius Caesar's great nephew, and actually his designated heir, and a man named Mark Antony. Not Jennifer Lopez's good friend and creator of clothing and perfume lines. Isn't he Mark Antony? Isn't that some sort of fashion singer guy? Okay. Good, I don't care about that either. But Mark Antony is another Roman general, and Octavian and Mark Antony go to war. Now, Mark Antony seeks an ally. He seeks support from a certain Egyptian queen known as Cleopatra. And you might say, what was Mark Antony doing in Cleopatra? Well, by this, what was Mark Antony doing in Egypt? <laughs> like, wow, that sounded weird. <laughs> I, maybe you could edit the film for that part. <laughs> Too bad. <laughs> what was Rome doing in Egypt? statement of the semester, but I'll say lots of other dumb things too, I'm sure. <laughs> what, was, what was Mark Antony doing in, in Egypt? Well, Rome had been in Egypt actually for a long time. Here's the weird thing. Julius Caesar had been in Egypt, seeking to, to conquer Egypt, had already met Cleopatra, had already fallen in love. Julius Caesar and Cleopatra had already had a romantic dalliance. Should I define dalliance? They had been lovers. Julius Caesar died. Mark Antony now seeks Cleopatra's support. Mark Antony and Cleopatra, otherwise known as Marcus Antonius, become lovers too. And if this sounds like an ancient soap opera, pretty much. Somebody should make a movie! Oh, trust me, it's been done many times. Okay, so. Mark Antony allies himself with Cleopatra. They fight against Octavian and the Battle of Actium. Do you know who wins? Octavian wins. Mark Antony and Cleopatra's allied forces are defeated. And about a year later, after fleeing into exile, basically living in fear of their lives, Mark Antony and Cleopatra both commit suicide. So a tragic end to this love story. And according to one ancient legend, Cleopatra commits suicide or dies by inducing or causing a poisonous snake to bite her. And I don't know why I'm doing this. It's, I guess to represent the snake or something. Right? <laughs> but she is, according to this story, this is not known definitely to be true, but according to this, um, Story she dies by being bitten by a poisonous ass. In any case, Octavian now established himself, his, himself as the emperor of Rome. Octavian renames himself Caesar Augustus. And if you are familiar with the Bible, you know that Caesar Augustus then is ruling when Jesus is born according to the gospel accounts in the New Testament. Now, I am largely going to abbreviate, that is, mostly skip, all of the interesting centuries of the Roman Empire and say some very general things because this class is what it is and we go pretty quickly. The next few centuries will be characterized by what the Romans liked to describe as the Pax Romana, which means the peace of Rome. And to a certain extent that was true. Rome was able to bring about a great deal of stability and order to the areas that it conquered. Now, was Rome brutal? Yes. Was Rome perfectly willing to kill lots of people to maintain that order? Yes. Was Rome violent? Yes. But did it also establish order, the rule of law, <coughs> stability in the areas that it conquered? That's also true. So the period of the Pax Romana means the peace of Rome, and many even of Rome's conquered peoples viewed it as a benefit. Not all of Roman rule was bad. Now, if you wanted to be independent, well, you were going to have to fight Rome to maintain or to achieve your independence. But Rome does bring about a number of 
helpful benefits, you might say, including the development of infrastructure. I don't have the word infrastructure on the board, on the screen, maybe I should. But the word infrastructure, actually I'm going to do that on the fly, maybe we shouldn't. But given that it's a useful word anyway, I shouldn't do it this way. Infrastructure, I can't write and type at the same time. Does that look right to you? Infrastructure. All right. Infrastructure just means the structures or the means of communications and transportation. So today we might say that our infrastructure in modern Lithuania or in many of the parts of the world that you hail from originally include things like telephone cables and fiber optic for telephones and freeways and bridges. And obviously not all of those things were present in ancient Rome, but Rome did build infrastructure like roads and bridges and aqueducts and even cities themselves that facilitated or enabled people to travel and to trade. Also enabled Rome to move its soldiers quickly from one part of the empire to another to suppress revolts. But something like 80,000 kilometers of roads were constructed throughout the Roman Empire such that there was an ancient saying that perhaps you have heard all roads lead to Rome. So, Rome were great, the Romans were great builders. I mentioned that on Monday briefly too. You can still see remnants of Roman infrastructure throughout the Roman Empire, <coughs> parts of Hadrian's Wall in England, aqueducts in Israel, the Colosseum in Rome, very many, many other things that Rome built, including the Oppian Way, that road I showed you a picture of on Monday, uh, still visible. So Romans were great builders. Another aspect of the Pax Romana, this period of the Roman Empire, was that emperors came to be deified. The word deified means they began to be treated as gods. We might be more technical and say they began to be treated as demigods. D-E-M-I-G-O-D-S. A demigod is a sort of half-god or a partial god. And Roman Empire, the emperors encouraged this. This begins with Caesar Augustus. So if you're arrogant enough to see yourself as a god, you encourage people to worship you as a god. But in the period of the Roman Empire, emperors were worshipped, and there were temples built in their honor, and there were sacrifices made in honor of the emperor. There were prayers said to the emperor, not just on behalf of the emperor, but actually to the emperor, to his divine spirit. There were festivals in honor of the worship of the emperor. There was another religious group growing during this period, in the beginning of the first century, followers of Jesus Christ, known as Christians, and those Christians had a problem with emperor worship. So did Jews, for that matter. Jews and Christians believed that worship of the emperor was blasphemous, was idolatrous. They were to worship the one, one God, the, the God of the Bible. And so for that reason and some others, because Christians refused to engage in this kind of emperor cult, this emperor worship, many Christians were persecuted. And if you know anything about the history of Christianity, you know that in the first few centuries, Christians faced sometimes imprisonment, sometimes death for their faith, uh, sometimes being tortured in the Colosseums, not just in Rome, but throughout the empire, and sometimes faced other forms of social oppression because of their faith. There were other reasons, too, that Christians were persecuted, Christians talked about drinking somebody's blood and eating somebody's body. And if you grew up in a church, you know that that's language that's in the Bible that refers to the Eucharist, or depending on your understanding, the Lord's Supper or Communion, or if you grew up in a Roman Catholic church, the Mass. 
with this symbolic representation of Christ's body and Christ's blood, bread, and wine. I forgot to mention that without clarifying it further, but I'm going to leave it at that. But it's a symbol of Christ's body and blood, and Romans heard Christians talking about that and said, Christians are eating somebody. They must be cannibals. A cannibal is someone who eats another person. Christians didn't worship the Roman gods. They worshiped the god you couldn't see. Sometimes Christians were accused of being atheists. It seems kind of weird. But because they worshiped an invisible god, the Romans said they don't worship any god at all. Christians were thought to be threats to the social order because they didn't honor the Roman gods. What if the Roman gods get mad? And so for a variety of reasons, Christians were suspicious, were viewed as suspicious by the Romans. And many Christians were persecuted, not everywhere always in the same ways. It depended on local circumstances, it depended on local governors, it depended on the time period that often Christians were persecuted but in large part because they wouldn't engage in this emperor cult, this emperor worship. The period of the Roman Empire also was a period of a certain amount of prosperity. Rome had its troubles, we'll talk about them in a moment, briefly. But because of Rome's construction of infrastructure, Rome did encourage trade. Romans were, for the most part, uh, dedicated to business as well as to conquest, and so the Roman Empire did bring a certain amount of prosperity and also united a very, very large area, at least for its time, something like 5 million square kilometers at the greatest extent. So just to give a couple of numbers as we seek to describe the Roman Empire, comparable to another Empire off to the east. We haven't talked about Han China yet. We will. But just so we know that Rome was not necessarily the biggest or the only empire of roughly this size on the planet at the time, Han China was also quite large. And Rome's population <laughs> at its greatest extent, something like 50 million people. So, one final thing to say about the Pax Romana. Was it a period of peace? Well, sort of. You might say it was a peace built on, on violence. Rome continued to put down revolts and rebellions. Rome continued to fight wars on its frontiers, to guard against invaders. So Rome was perfectly willing to use violence, but at the same time, the Roman Empire, or Rome did seek to bring about stability and order. And because of the power that it was able to wield, it did maintain that sort of peace for many of the people within its domain. Again, we are skipping any sort of discussion about most of these emperors. The third century. So the third century, those years in the 200s, especially the middle decades of the third century were difficult ones for the Roman Empire. It faced a crisis, a series of crises. These were years of political instability. These were years of real problems for Rome. A period of ongoing civil war that is struggles for power. And just by way of illustration, during these years, these roughly 50 years, there were 22 emperors. Only two of them did not die a violent death. So 20 of them were killed, either in battle or actually most of them by assassination. So that's an indication that being emperor was not a safe occupation dangerous thing. One emperor, I forget which, I should know this, I should look it up again, but one emperor had mirrors, not glass mirrors you might be familiar with, but more like polished bronze mirrors that they had, but had, he had mirrors installed at the corners of hallways. On Alexander, do you know why? Is that what you guys were discussing? Are you talking about something? 
So these mirrors were, he had them installed in hallways. Any guesses? The corners of hallways. Right? You can see if anybody's sneaking up on you. You can see if there are potential assassins lurking around the corner. So many of them lived in fear of their lives and with good reason many of them were assassinated. So this is a period of problems, not just within the, within the empire, but also it was a period in which Rome faced ongoing external threat. Various invasions, both from the Persians off to the east, Persians were still around just because Alexander the Great had conquered the Persians did not mean they somehow disappeared. But also from Germanic tribes off to the north, whom the Romans referred to as barbarians. Maybe some of your ancestors. Maybe some of my ancestors. Maybe your great, 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 great granddad, I think, was king was a barbarian who invaded Rome, who knows? Uh, maybe mine. Rome continued to face an increasing number of these invasions. Eventually, this is going to lead to the collapse of the Western Roman Empire, but more on that later. A series of epidemics, including plague and economic troubles, exacerbated by all of these things together. Increasingly, many Romans and some emperors believed that Rome, that the Roman Empire was too big to administer as a single unit. And that maybe there was a solution. And finally, an emperor named Diocletian acted on that hunch, on that belief. And so in the late Roman Empire, two strong emperors that sought to, gain, to give Rome new life, but in radically different ways. Diocletian was one of them. Diocletian initiated a series of reforms, so he changed the way the governing system was set up, he reorganized the bureaucracy. But most drastically, what Diocletian did was to split the empire. So he divided it into two, east and west. kept Rome as the capital of the western half of the empire, chose a new city as capital of the eastern half of the Roman Empire. Any guesses? What's that? Yeah. Except not Constantinople yet, but instead it was the city of Byzantium. Now, by the way, the city of Istanbul. This then becomes the second important, most important city in the Roman Empire, and the division looks something like this. So, Byzantium here, Rome here, two halves of the empire, two capitals, still officially ruled from Rome, but the eastern half is administered by another emperor and a co-emperor. So let me explain this a little bit further. Diocletian <coughs> splits the empire into two and creates a system of emperors and co-emperors. You might say emperors and junior emperors. An emperor in the east, an emperor in the west. Together these were known as Augusta, which I'm not going to ask you to know. And then two junior emperors, one in the east, one in the west. And these men will be known as Caesars. And the idea was that when the Augusti, when the emperors died or were killed, then the junior emperors would ascend to power, and there would be a new junior emperor appointed. And somehow, in Diocletian's mind, he thought this was going to work. For some reason, he thought this was a workable system. It doesn't. Or it, it ends up simply making things more complicated. Now, instead of struggles for power, to gain one position, there are struggles for power to gain four positions. And now you have three additional people who think they have the right to rule the whole thing anyway. And so Diocletian's attempt at reform ends up not really working. It makes things worse in some ways. And Diocletian tries something else because he, believe, he comes increasingly to believe that the old Roman gods, Jupiter, Mercury, 
Aeschylus, that these Roman gods have abandoned the Roman Empire because they are not sufficiently being worshipped. Who in the Roman Empire is not worshipping the Roman gods? Christians. It may be Christians were part of the problem, so Diocletian initiates or begins yet another persecution, one of the worst persecutions that Christians had to face during the period of the Roman Empire. And many Christians, thousands of Christians, in from various places in the Roman Empire end up dying for their faith. But it's part of Diocletian's effort to rescue the Roman Empire. He believes some of its troubles are religious in nature. Angelica, does this make sense? I explained this clearly. Now I can try to Diocletian is one of these strong empires, and the second is Constantine. You can ask the Constantine who's here on campus from Kazakhstan if he was named after this emperor. Maybe originally, I don't know. But this is the name or originally. Constantine. Um, he did not die because he had a hole in his head, by the way. That's just in the statue. Constantine was one of the heirs. He was a son of one of these co-emperors. So Constantine believes that he is destined for greatness, that he is destined for power. And Constantine is not satisfied with someday being a junior emperor. Constantine wants to rule the entire Roman Empire. He is not the only one who wants to rule the entire Roman Empire. He has to fight his way to power, including against one of his main rivals, a man named Maxentius. Maxentius and Constantine go to war with their respective armies at the Battle of the Milvian Bridge, which I'm sure was on the tip of your tongues. And before the battle, as Constantine prepares for what will be the battle of his life, the battle that will either make his future or lead to his death, Constantine has a vision that he believes is the Christian God approving of his plan. This is a much later painting of the Battle of the Bridge. But Constantine believes that he has been given a vision of a cross in the sky, actually consisting of the first two letters of the word Christ in Greek, Chi and Rho, this combination, sort of a Christianized, well, it's not a good way to put it, a cross with the letters of, the first two letters of Christ's name superimposed on the cross. Did I say that correctly? A, a form of the cross made up of these two Greek letters inscribed above written in the sky above this sort of cross are the words conquered by this. In other words, conquered by the sign of the Christian cross. Again, in short, Constantine believes that Jesus is telling him that he will win the battle. The battle begins. Constantine's and Maxentius' armies battle it out. Maxentius ends up being killed. Actually, according to one story, he fell off the bridge and was pulled underwater by the weight of his armor and drowns. Constantine wins the battle and then has Maxentius' body brought up from under the river and has Maxentius' head cut off and sends Maxentius' head to some of Maxentius' supporters in North Africa, making the message pretty clear. Uh, you should stop fighting now. I won. So, like a really gory postcard. And I think I'll stop talking about that. Okay. Constantine wins. Constantine believes that the Christian God has given him the victory. And Constantine converts to Christianity himself. Constantine becomes a Christian. Now, in any book that you read, any history book about Constantine, you will read that there are some doubts about, about Constantine's conversion, how genuine it was, and with a certain amount of good reason. Uh, Constantine actually was not baptized as a Christian until he was on his deathbed. Uh, so why did he wait that long? He 
he has some doubts about his own Christianity. Based on some of the coins that Constantine had minted or that were used during his reign, they still spoke of the Roman gods. So was it a case that Constantine wasn't really a Christian, or was he a real Christian who still was sort of worshiping the Roman gods, or was he just speaking of the Roman gods to unite people in his empire who still believed in them, or was he worshiping Jesus alongside the Roman gods? Some of the nature of Constantine's Christianity is still unclear. However, what's important historically is that Constantine says that he has become a Christian, and Constantine issues something called the Edict of Milan that legalizes Christianity. This is a radical change for Christians. You can imagine what this would have been like. To be a Christian who for centuries, you and your ancestors, have been living in fear of your lives, again depending on who was emperor and what the laws were at the time, but to have been living as a marginalized religious group, a group facing persecution, now suddenly to have the emperor himself claiming your faith as his own. So Christianity is legalized in the edict or the law, the commandment of Milan in 313. Some dates, I told you, I will ask you to know, and probably the Edict of Milan is a good one to remember. So if I offer as a multiple choice question of a variety of dates, yeah, 313 is a good one to know. Again, most dates, I'm not going to ask you to memorize. History is not a series of dates, it's a story. You can find the dates on Google. But some dates are good just to have in our heads. So this is one of them. Make sense? Edict of Milan legalizes Christianity. Why does Constantine do this? Well, again, he, he's converted to Christianity in some form himself. Again, allowing for some doubts about the genuineness of his conversion. It also seems clear that Constantine has some political reasons for claiming Christianity as his own faith, and that is that he wants to use Christianity as a unifying force. It makes a certain amount of sense. Romans worship all kinds of gods. Different gods are worshipped in different ways. Some cities celebrate some gods over others. And it led to a sort of fragmented religious system that Constantine may have believed led to a fragmented political system as well. Christianity worships one god, one god, one emperor, one empire. Makes a certain amount of sense. So it may be that Constantine, faced with these, these difficulties that Diocletian had attempted to fix by reorganizing the empire, that Constantine wants to use Christianity in the same unifying way. Constantine unites the empire under his own rule. However, Constantine believes that he can better rule from further east. Moves his capital from Rome to Byzantium, which he renames after himself, Constantinople, again now, this time. The reforms, the split that Diocletian began, even though Constantine reunites both halves, but that split will continue to have implications and effects down in the cent uh, down through the centuries to come, because to make this long long story very 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 <coughs> short, this split between east and west eventually, as the western half of the Roman Empire falls apart, the eastern half will continue. Sorry, I didn't say it very clearly. But let me describe that collapse very quickly. Rome there. Rome again uh, continues to face a number of invasions, including by people known as the Goths, who were a people group, not a people who dyed their hair black and wore eyeshadow and listened to certain types of music. But the Goths, people from Central and Northern Europe, to 
divided into a number of other groups, two of the primary ones being the Visigoths and the Ostrogoths, East Goths and West Goths. But one of those groups, the Visigoths, sacked Rome. Perhaps sack is not a word that I should use, meaning, meaning conquest. The Visigoths conquer Rome in 410. Rome continues, however, to be the capital of this western part of the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire continues, although now crippled. Another group called the Vandals attack and conquer Rome again. Still, Rome survives. There are still Roman emperors after even the Vandal attack, but finally in 476, the last Roman emperor is deposed, that is, removed from his throne by a Germanic king known as Odoacer, whose origins are somewhat unclear, but it came from Northern Europe somewhere. When this final Roman emperor is removed, that really marks the official end of the western half of the Roman Empire. Now it's going to change quite dramatically. Now it will be, in many ways, the Roman church that serves as the unifying force in Rome. But the ancient Roman Empire, with all the political and cultural aspects that that entailed, that western half of the Roman Empire has now fallen apart. The eastern half of the Roman Empire, however, centered at Constantinople, continues to exist and do far more than simply exist. It continues to thrive, to flourish, and to produce all sorts of amazing cultural and even philosophical and religious achievements. And that kingdom becomes known as Byzantine Empire. We'll talk about that some later. But just so we know now that the 5th century marks the end of the Western Roman Empire, the Eastern half of the Roman Empire again continues and eventually evolves into the Byzantine Empire, harkening back to that old name of Byzantium. All right, well, that was exciting. Yes? All this stuff, uh, I guess what I'm going to do with this stuff. I'm going to skip it. Um, yeah. Hate to do that, but let's move on. Since we're behind already, but I'm going to move on and talk about Islam. Oh, I guess what I'm going to do with this fun activity I had planned. Uh, I'm going to skip that too. All right, Islam. Moving on.